So what about Rahab? Who exactly is she? And what is the significance of her story? In chapter 2 covers the two spies and Rahab. Rahab had heard of the miracles wrought on behalf of Israel and had become convinced that Israel's God was a true God in verses 10 and 11. And when she met the spies, she decided at the risk of her life to cast her lot with Israel and their God. She may not have been as bad as the word harlot now implies. She lived among people without morals. Priestesses of the Canaanite religion were public prostitutes. Her profession was considered by the people among whom she lived as honorable and not disgraceful, as it now is among us. Rahab married an Israelite named Salmon. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, you can read about it. Caleb had a son named Salmon. In 1 Chronicles chapter 2 verse 51, it may have been the same Salmon. If so, then she married into a leading family of Israel. She thus became the ancestress of Boaz, David, and of Christ. She is named among the heroes of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 31. And for an archaeological note, Rahab's house on the wall in chapter 2, verse 15. In Jericho, they did build houses on the wall. Now, of course, my book here reveals the actual pictures, but uh, I'm not going to decide to do that in crossing the River Jordan so that no water flowed past the water stand for Joshua. At any point, it was a mighty miracle and terrified the already frightened Canaanites in chapter 5 verse 1. Jesus, 1400 years later, was baptized in the Jordan at the same place where Joshua crossed. Alright, I'm going to skip the fall of Jericho. You guys can read about that yourselves. The battle with the sun stood still. Gibeon about 10 miles northwest of Jerusalem, was one of the largest cities in chapter 10, verse 2. The Gibeonites, frightened at the fall of Jericho and Ai, made haste to enslave themselves in Israel. This enraged the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lashish, and Eglon. And they marched against Gibeon. Then Joshua came to the rescue of Gibeon. This led to the famous battle of Gibeon, Beth Horon and westward where the sun stood still for a whole day. In what way the sun stood still, we do not know. Some have calculated that the calendar lost a day about that time. At any rate, in some way or another, daylight was miraculously prolonged so that Joshua's victory might have been complete. In receiving the Gibeonites who submitted to him, as Christ does all that come to him, in his conquest of the several kings of the Canaanites, so Christ had conquered all the spiritual enemies of his people, sin, Satan, and the world, in bringing and settling the people of Israel in the land of Canaan, their rest, dividing it to them by lot, which Moses might not do. So Christ only brings souls into true rest, into spiritual rest here, and eternal rest hereafter, in whom they obtain the inheritance of the heavenly glory by lot, and by whom they enjoy salvation and eternal life, and not by the works of the law. This book contains a history of Joshua and of his government, his acts and deeds, from the death of Moses to his own. Also, it is good to note that like the Gibeonites, the last remnant of Edom did the same thing, fulfilling the prophecy of the Jews who possess a remnant of Edom. You can read about that in John Hyrcanus and the Maccabees in the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus, or just check out one of my videos explaining the entire historical event. One more interesting fact about the Gibeonites was in Joshua chapter 5 verse 8. They abode in the camp till they were whole. A commentary explains, this required several days. You can see notes on Genesis chapter 34, 24 and 34, 25. And basically the adults were circumcised. They were obliged to keep their beds for about three weeks, or at least during the time that they were not able to walk about, but with great difficulty. Is it not strange that during this time that they were not attacked by the inhabitants of the land and utterly destroyed, which might have been easily affected? You can see a case for the poor Shechemites as related in chapter 34, verse 24, 31 of Genesis with the notes there. Joshua, as an able general, would at once perceive that his very measure of this must expose his whole host to the danger of being totally annihilated. But he knew that God could not err, and that it was his duty to obey. Therefore, in the very teeth of his enemies, he reduced the major part of his army to a state of total helplessness, simply trusting for protection in the arm of God. The sequel shows that his confidence was not misplaced. During the whole time, 
God did not permit any of their enemies to disturb them. The path of duty is a path of safety, and it is impossible for any soul to be injured while walking in the path of obedience. But why did not God order them to be circumcised while they were on the east side of Jordan in a state of great security? Because he chose to bring them into the straits and difficulties where no counsel or might but his own could infallibly direct and save them. And this he did that they might see the excellence and power was of God and not of man. For the same reason he caused them to pass the Jordan at the same time that it overflowed its banks, and not at the time when it was low and easily fordable, that he might have the better opportunity to show them that they were under his immediate care and protection, and convince them of his almighty power, that they might trust in him forever, and not fear the force of any of their adversaries. In both cases, how apparent are the wisdom, power, and goodness of God. Now, that's how important circumcision was an act of dedicating your life to God alone, regardless of race, nation, tribe, or class. Lastly, to wrap it all up, after all the conquering and all the division of the lands, Joshua's farewell address was his main urge, which was against idolatry. Canaanite territory uh, was such an aesthetic combination of religion with free indulgence of fleshly desire that only persons of exceptional strength of character could withstand as a learner.